Aloha and welcome. We are so pleased you decided to join us. My name is Mira Garud and I am an instructor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we're honored today to have Jennifer Agena from Iolani School present Helen Keller's Not Real, Developing a Media Literacy Curriculum for Ninth Graders. Jennifer's bio is available on the event website. And this evening's presentation by Jennifer is part of a series of programs presented as part of Misinformation Week a week-long slate of events that explore important themes related to misinformation. This recording will be available to all conference attendees. Right now you're all muted, so please type your questions in the chat box. Over to you, Jennifer. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm just uh, I'm just happy to be able to share what we've been doing at Iolani for about three years now. and. Um, we've been basically developing a media literacy curriculum for ninth graders. So I will share my screen and there we go. Okay. So um, I'm not sure how widespread this Helen Keller is not real thing went, but um, I think it was last year or so there was, a, it was going around on social media that Helen Keller wasn't real and there was all these you know these kids saying no she wasn't real and everything so we decided to kind of have fun with that and we put that in our title we also had made a video of it too for our school but in any case we just thought that would be like a kind of a fun title for the presentation but um about our media literacy class this is um kind of the brainchild of our head of school dr tim control he um listened to this podcast and um along with that and then the happenings of 2020 with COVID and all the misinformation going around at the time, um, they decided that this is something that they wanted to make a priority and to um, put media literacy, make it a, a mandatory class for all ninth graders. And so um, they couldn't dedicate a whole year to it, but they gave us half a quarter. <laughs> so, um, so this is something that all ninth graders have to take. Um, it's part of the thing called sequence nine. I think some um, high school and middle schools have wheel programs where they have um, a chorus and they just sort of cycle in. And so this is one of those things that all students have to cycle through. And um, so it's it's half a quarter long. And it is a, a satisfactory or unsatisfactory course. So it's not graded. And as a result, um, our school mandates also that it's not, there's no homework for that too. So that's how it's run. Um, so the sources that we consulted were um, Stanford Education Guru, we have MediaWise, and then along with the crash course videos um, from John Green. Um, Common Sense Media, we, we took a few lessons from them. News Literacy Project, we um, looked at for some examples. Um, they have really good ready to go lessons um, if you have the time and to dedicate to those lessons that they have, but they're really good. And the SIFT is something we also look at I think weekly, it, they um, give really good emails and, you know, good examples again. So I'm going to mention examples a lot because that that's the struggle that we have is to find examples to use in our class. So the units of study that we have are um, social media platforms and problematic content for our first unit. I say units because our class is only, um, it, it ends up being about 15 classes long, 15, five, 15, 50 minute classes. So, so units can go really quickly, but um, the first unit is about maybe like two weeks or half a week and a half long. And then we roll into journalism, which is actually only three days, I think three class periods. That's why I said units. And then our last one is on lateral reading. Um, so the journalism one we just put in this summer. So this is our first year actually finishing that, um, doing that unit. So the first one, um, the first activity we have the students do is just to create their, their app, their own app. And so it's sort of a creative process. They can work in groups. Um, it's one of the few things that they can do collaboratively. So we wanted to do that. And, um, and so there, there is an end product to this, but we wanted them to just sort of come up with a name, the description, kind of get them to thinking like an app developer rather than a user. So talking about if they're going to allow features, um, what kind of content are they focusing on and their audience, the ways that they can interact because they have to interact as a social media app. And then um, and then start to get th thinking about money. How are they gonna make money? Um, because it is all kind of about that, right? So if um, are they gonna allow advertising, influencers, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
And so then they, they have fun thinking of this, these things. And, um, and some of the more creative ones, you know, like, so this is actually from the last unit that I just had. So they write it on the whiteboard and then they just take a picture and upload it. But this one started off a little shaky. <laughs> they, they were talking about cocoa melon and I was thinking cocoa melon, what are you going to do about cocoa melon? But then <laughs> they said they wanted to use it as a social media sort of um, prepare children how to use social media safely and things like that so it's just you know a dream concept they don't actually have to do it but um talking about how they're going to use the videos and the characters to sort of encourage kids to use social media safely and then the other one was a dream designer where they take pictures of um, sketches that they do and then supposedly there's a button you can press and money you can pay and then someone will sew the clothes for them <laughs> and bring your designs to life right so I thought that was kind of creative but um but they are you know um addressing whether or not they're going to allow advertising and influencers and all that and all that um and so they will revisit that at a later time and so then um after we do this we do international regulations of social media so we're talking about um we got this from the Center for Digital Wellbeing. It's the policy group in um, Australia. And they came up with the report in December, 2021 that kind of outlined what every country sort of tries, is trying to do to address social media. And so um, so we have them look up different countries. So like it's, they have not all of the countries but the ones that are sort of trying to do things. And so China, was one and China is by far is the most opposite from the US, I think, in terms of what we do with social media and what they do with social media. So so it's very interesting for the students to be able to see that, you know, just because what we do is not have to be done. Like it, it could be done in other ways. There are other options to how we do things. And so you know, so they their job is to look at their assigned country and then um, kind of outline what the guidelines are. And then how do they think Americans re would react if we had those guidelines? Um, and then they share out with each other in the different countries that they had. So that's, um, again, just for them to see a bigger picture and to show that other people do things in different ways. Um, we then go on to the capital riots because um, I think with every time that I teach this class, they seem to be more far removed to from when it happened and what happened, um, because I think, well, they're ninth graders now, which means that they were in seventh grade when the Capitol riots occurred. And so I think some of them don't really know what happened, um, at least to the extent, like the violence and the just everything, how serious it was. And so I show them the video that was shown in the hearing, um, the January 6th committee hearing. And I don't show the whole thing. And I do warn them that they're swearing and that there's violence, you know, in it. But but I think it kind of makes the point to them. I think they they very much understand, you know, how then online is sort of transferred into real life. And this is an example of that that we just had. So so we we show them that video. Um, and then this is when they revisit their app. And then we talk about um that they're getting sued now, you know, hypothetically they're pretend getting sued because there has been a personal attack, hate speech, and mis and disinformation on their website. So lawyers are upset and they want to talk to them about this and they want them to do something about it. So what are they going to do? And so we just have them address, um, we want them to qualify or define what is a personal attack, hate speech, and mis and disinformation. And then if they're going to allow those kinds of things on their app and how would they respond or consequences and and then does it matter you know if it's a celebrity posting it an influencer posting these things um, just to have them start to think about the things that an app developer would have to think about um and so it's interesting because i think you know for the most part a lot of these kids they they, they say that it doesn't matter, you know, when influencers like, uh, oh, no, everybody's the same. It doesn't matter if if it's somebody rich and famous that are posting these things. But but then the conversation is had later about like, why does it why does it seem to matter in real life? You know, like we give the Donald Trump and Twitter example, like why was he allowed so many concessions or what did he bring, you know, to Twitter that they had a hard time letting him go. And so, you know, they talk about money and people's livelihoods. It's a company you're in employing all these people, you know, and they bring money and, and, and eyes to your website. So, you know, so things like that. So they, we do have that conversation about that. Um, and then we go into algorithms where we show them a video or a few videos, um, Dylan Roof, 
uh, filter bubbles. And then we have them read about social media business models, um, basically about how they make money, because even though it's free, it's, um, it's not really free. <laughs> they're, um, they're buying your attention, they're buying your time. So even though you're not paying money, they're still getting money from you in that way. So just to um, not and not to discourage them, I always tell them it's not about um, telling you not to use social media or not to be on these platforms. It's just just to be aware, like you can make your choice, but just to make it with the knowledge that they want these things from you. And if you're OK with that, that's fine. <laughs> but, but just to not do it ignorantly. Um, and then. So the filter bubbles about the dangers of it, about, you know, it's like being in an echo chamber, about only getting the things that you agree with and that the algorithm thinks you like and would appreciate versus um, seeing everything that you should see, um, not just the things you want to see. Um, and then the miseducation, Dylan Roof. I think this speaks also, you know, um, Dylan Roof shot those people in a church, right? Um, and I think um, it kind of shows um, that even though some people think some of the students that we have think it doesn't matter to them because they are able to sift through mis and disinformation. They're, you know, they're not to say they're above it, but they can identify it. So to them, why is it a big deal? Why are we talking about this? But, but to show that, you know, just because you can sift through these things doesn't mean everybody can. And it kind of impacts you whether you like it or not, you know? And so to show that, you know, in this case, it's an extreme case, but in Miss Education with Dylan Roof shows that these people in the church, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. And yet things still happened to them because he was, um, was led the wrong way. So that um, is something we show them. And then we do a few things. Unfortunately, TikTok had, had come up in the news quite a bit at the time. So we talked about their algorithms and how they were under fire about, um, you know, their uh, I think they were flagged, they're flagging the Black Lives Matter, um, I guess, uh, posts as harmful. And, and so people are getting upset because they said Black plus audience equals um, the, the word die is an audience. And so that's why it was flagging it, the algorithm was flagging it. And so I think um, this sort of, again, addresses back to when they made their app and some of them would say that they would want bots or um, algorithms to sort of monitor their, their, um, their site to make sure that it's okay. But, but the problems with that is that people are still programming these things and it's hard to catch everything, you know, and it, it and so I guess the difficulties of that. Um, and then we go into a, TikTok cyberbullying, NPR podcast about free or speech or hate speech, and then Pepe, the frog, who has actually gained popularity in the three years that we've been doing this. In the beginning, nobody knew who Pepe was, and now I would say over half the class, the kids all know who that is, but but I guess they didn't know his history about um, being used as a hate symbol and things like that, so it's really interesting how that sort of morphed and um, but anyway, it, we talk about cyberbullying and, and they go through these things where they read something and then they answer questions, they listen to a podcast, they answer questions, and then they watch a video. So it's kind of a nice um, package day that we do this. And then we have a discussion at the end about, you know, free speech, hate speech, after they had the chance to sort of write their thoughts, then they can share it um, in our discussion. Um, last to kind of wrap up our first unit, we have them do like a walkthrough of problematic content. And so we, we found all of these posts and everything, and we put them up against around the walls and we have them address these three things. Um, so what's problematic about it? What would the impact be if it went viral? And then what should the social media platform do as a result? So under each post, they have to write three things. And so, so like this one, um, and then another example that we, oops, that we had was like a cyber bullying one. And then the other one was um, Marjorie Taylor, Marjorie Green. So, so things like that. And so, and, and a lot of the kids don't know that, that she's a politician and she was elected successfully. And so I think they, they really um, are surprised. And a lot of them ask, you know, did we make these? And it's like, no, we didn't make any of these. We, this is all from social media. So they're kind of surprised that, that these kinds of things actually are out there. Um, and then we go into our second unit journalism where we've, we've gotten things from learning for justice. And um, so these are some of the essential questions we ask them. We're um, 
we first start off with the history of journalism using the PBS uh, video out there. And just to kind of, um, I guess, outline how far it's come in journalism, where now everything, everybody could be a journalist as long as you have a smartphone and everything. But the difference is, you know, that you you lose some of that credibility when that happens. And, and so we have that conversation and then we go into bias, um, which is this lesson. And so we have them look at a, we show them the slide and we tell them that, you know, we're looking for charged words or um, words that carry weight, carry meaning, you know, that journalists use words for a reason to convey their opinions or what they want you to, how they want you to feel. And so we have them um, highlight in their selected readings, kind of like this, like the different charged words or phrases that they can find. And then I think the idea is that hopefully it would paint a picture as to what the journalist is trying to convey. When you just look at all of these charged words, you know, when they use the words disturbing like three times in a short paragraph, you kind of know that they want you to feel disturbed, um, things like that, you know, I'm um, just very, um, I guess, strong words or strong images that they try to, that make you come to mind. So um, that's one of the, this is one of the more challenging, I think, activities we have them do. Um, and so after that, we ask, ask them to fill out what, what are the facts, um, just basically what is the article about, um, how extreme is it on a scale of one through five, what would you say um, the article was, and the perspective or point of view of the person who wrote it. So those are the three things we have them do. And then this is an example of the, the sort of reading choices we had. So we tried to get the same news story, but tried to get them from two different publications and two different angles. And so to have the students see that, you know, it's essentially the same news story, but again, written very differently and trying to send different messages through that. Then the last thing we do for the news unit or the journalism unit is the types of information. And we just show them, um, we just teach them about each type that's here. So um, uh, so an example would be like, we give them basically like a news, what news is um, and everything like that. And then we give them a topic for them to find on the internet that has to do with their topic. So an example would be if my topic is Yolani school and I have to find a news article, then this is my slide that I'm gonna do for news. So. Um, some of the topics they had were like COVID, school uniforms. I think we put Elon Musk as once once. And I think Johnny Depp, that trial was Amber Heard. We did that for a topic once before when it was more relevant. Um, so this is an example of a student who did an on COVID and theirs was an opinion piece. And so then this was their example for opinion. And then another one was propaganda. And we had them make up their own if they couldn't find propaganda, you know, so this student thought that that would be fun if he just made this up. So, um, so the, the point is that, you know, if they know what they're looking for when they are actually ingesting these types of information, then they kind of know what to look for. So if they're being sold something, then it's good that they're aware that this is an advertising piece of information. If it's humorous, it's not meant to get your news from the humor um, and, and things like that, so. Um, then we go on to lateral reading, which is our last unit, and we have them um, first, before we teach them lateral reading, we just have them take this easiest quiz of all time, and again, it's from the, the NLP, and um, so this is some of the questions that they take, and it's really fast, like about six questions, seven questions, and it's really easy questions, supposedly, but, you know, from this, most people would choose, like, letter A. Luke, I am your father, and it's actually no, I am your father's letter B, right? So, so depending on their um, knowledge of Star Wars <laughs> and how much they know, if they really watched it and they're fans, then they get really upset and they start to think like, no, this quiz is dumb and it's not right and it's fake. And so it's interesting to see their reactions to that because it kind of then leads to our backfire effect where we talk about um, why we react that way to some pieces of information when we're confronted with things that are not in line with what we thought or what we believe to be true. Um, and oftentimes it has to do with our core beliefs or our background and how tightly um, tied to these things we are. But um, so then we just have them read this comic, which was really, um, it's a really good, it's really long though, but, but it's really helpful, I think, because it sort of tells them about this effect that makes them sort of deny things like that. 
And the, the understanding is that, you know, they have to be emotionally mature enough to recognize the fact that they could be wrong, because if they're not able to do that, then they won't even bother to look up if something is real or not real. And so it's sort of to get over themselves, to get over their egos <laughs> and, and the, just open up the possibilities that they could be wrong. And then to just kind of look to see if they are or not. And then we go into lateral reading, which is the tools to do this. So um, John Green, this is the first of two John Green videos we do show. He has about, I think, 10 or 11 or something. He has a lot, but and they're all great, but it's just a lot. <laughs> so, so we chose this one. Um, he does a good job of um, defining lateral reading, which is um, when you go from tab to tab to see what um, other people are saying about the information you're looking at just to make sure that it's sort of verifying it in other places. And so um, so he kind of introduces the concept, shows people how to do it, shows the students how to do it. And then we go into our own demo where we talk about, um, we show this GOP teens tweet and then to say like, you know, are the Republican teen party really feeling this way? <laughs> and so then we think who is behind the information, who is tweeting this and to Google it, you know, to Google these people. And so we leave the site, we Google GOP teens, and then we immediately see that. Um, of course, we wouldn't go back to the first one because it goes back to where we were, but then the words parody comes up a lot, satire, we talk about what that means. And then out of the first, out of the screenshot, you know, I would say Atlantic by far is the best <laughs> resource other than Bustle and Reddit. So <laughs> we click on the Atlantic. And then it just does show that it's a political satire. It's not meant to be taken seriously. And, and from then you would know. Um, and so, so I did wanna show you an example of what we do for the minimum wage uh, example. Let me try and, okay. So this one is one that we actually have them look at. And I tell them, and I try to make the lateral reading, the first exercise that they do really easy because it can get pretty hard. And they're not if they're not used to clicking that tab and looking elsewhere for information, then it can get kind of overwhelming. So I just tell them that they don't have to um, read the article. We just talk about reading the, the headline and just what it's talking about, what it means. And then I ask them who's behind this information and no author, but that's really common with this kind of um, thing. But, you know, how would we find the group that's behind it? And so, you know, eventually people will say you can click on the about, which is great, right? And then you see that you have Employment Policies Institute, right? And they do have things written about them, but in the John Green video, he says, you shouldn't trust this just because they can say what they want to say. They're in charge of this website. You know, they can make it look believable and say whatever they want. So you need to exit that and look elsewhere. Another thing I have them do is make sure that they know they can go to the bottom sometimes and look by the copyright. And again, they would find the Employment Policies Institute. So, so just to practice. Um, so we would look up Employment Policies Institute. And again, this is taking us to their homepage, so we wouldn't go there. And uh, in the video, John Green says Wikipedia is a good place to start. Um, he welcomes it. He says it's, um, you know, uh, the largest database or, or wealth of information out there, especially with, um, I think, more modern or more up to, um, I guess, newer sort of co companies and everything. So it's actually kind of um, a good place to start. And the kids kind of welcome it because they go to Wikipedia anyway, honestly. But I just have to um, reiterate that they're not to use it for research papers. It's just to start their information um, seeking process, right? Um, and so we, we, it is, you know, we show that the Employment Policies Institute is a conservative nonprofit, but that they actually have an agenda and they produce research that's aimed towards reducing the minimum wage. And so when you go back to that article, I'll talk about the horrible things if they raise the minimum wage, then, you know, as the students, it are, you know, do they have an agenda? Are they actually um, unbiased? Are they, you know, so is this something that you should um, trustworthy? That is something that you could trust or should you look elsewhere for information? And they'll usually say, they should look elsewhere. So, um, so at least they know then that, you know, looking again at the website and not looking elsewhere can be problematic because you wouldn't know that they have an agenda. Um, let's see. Uh, and then the other thing that we do is, oh, is um, this 
sorry, is the compare and contrast. So then they go into the same um, sort of topics. So in this case, um, same sex parenting. And they, so there's an example by the American Academy of Pediatrics and then the College of Pediatricians um, and ACP and the AAP. And then they talk about the same thing, except they're just two very different organizations, although they sound really similar. And we just have the kids um, read the abstract for both to get an idea of what's being said and what the help, what where they stand, and then to look up to see what other people are saying about them. And and if you're unaware, but the ACP is pretty, um, they're pretty interesting group. So um, the kids kind of get kind of, um, I think they they kind of like that. And and then we go into and then I do show them the ACP's website because even though they're not really supposed to go to their website because they're supposed to find what other people are saying about them. Um, when we're done with this exercise, I like to show them this website because it's everything that John Green is kind of telling them that you have to look out for because they do have, you know, it's a nice website. It's very professional um, photography, no spelling or grammatical errors, you know, everything that you kind of think that fake websites would look like, but it's not fake. It's a real group. And, but when they look elsewhere, it's actually, um, some people call it a hate group, right? I mean, they've been identified as a hate group. They believe in conversion therapy. So it's very, um, it's a very um, different world when you do lateral read. And I guess the importance of that is shown there. Um, and then we go into not looking at who's behind the information, but rather than what's being said. So we give them an example of this, um, Ted Cruz and the Dorito QAnon symbol snack um, the snack chip stuck to his suit. So it was mistaken for a QAnon symbol and this whole thing. And so where they cannot, you know, exactly look up the user that posted it because it's Donald Trump is not my president. They won't find anything, but they can definitely look up the content, right? So, which is what we have them do. Um, and then they go on to do that in this case too. So with the Justin Timberlake and um, the teddy bears and guns, safety regulations and things. So then they're just looking up what's being said instead of who's behind the information. So much of the same practices we have them and it is redundant. Like I think the students really get tired after all of these different exercises, but we find that it was necessary because it is total practice. Like they have to practice for it to be second nature. Cause if for some of them, it's really not you know, to go elsewhere, to look up another tab, they just are not wired that way for some people. And so I think the act of doing this so long, they definitely get better with it over time. So, um, and along the way, we are growing their list of trusted sources because some of them are not, um, they don't watch the news, they don't read newspapers. And so their knowledge of how many different trusted news sources is so small. Um, and so I think with these, we kind of grow that and we keep a list on the the whiteboard in our classroom and we just have a growing list you know so like wikipedia snopes and politifact and we just keep on adding to it and so hopefully they sort of remember that you know even though if they don't remember why it's supposed to be a trusted source and one of those sources they can go to, at least they they recognize the name um and this is our um reverse image search exercise. So I know this is an age old one, but about the daisies and the Fukushima nuclear plant, but they don't know about it. So we talk about it and how you can reverse image search it. Um, now it's called Google Lens, I think instead. So we have them do this one. Um, and then the question in class would be, um, did the monkey take a selfie, right? And so um, an example that we do is like, sorry is like this one and oh wait where to go uh was it mm, sorry i didn't click on it okay so you just basically have to like um hold it down and then you can either search the image with google or copy the image and so for them they have ipads and some some of them if they're in safari it won't show so they'll just have to copy the image and for us we copy the image address instead just for demonstration's sake for them and they go to images they click on the camera and then they can paste the link um when that happens then it comes up with all of these of where the picture was used, right? And so, so the question that I posted them just if the monkey took a selfie and then they could hopefully choose something like NPR or Seattle Times or something and um, 
and then click on it and read to say that, oh my gosh, the monkey did take a selfie and in fact was part of a lawsuit about who owns the photo and stuff. And it was crazy, but um, but it was kind of a funny example. But the kids seem to like the picture, so that that works. Um, and then they go into another, again, another worksheet with um, a rubber duck in a Hong Kong harbor and to see if that's real and a Donald Trump times um, time cover time life cover or something and to see if that's real so we just have them again do more practice um and then this one is a videos we we sort of almost close with videos because that seems to be really entertaining so they we pulled some viral videos this one is from common sense media so we show them the video we talk about what makes viral videos and then having them practice um looking up the keywords again to see if the video is real or not um this one is more for fun but i think it kind of speaks to them because they are very much a youtube users. So, so I think this one, they sort of like the most too. Um, and so the top one, the snowboarder was actually, I think from, was from common sense media as well. Um, but then we had to find some other videos too. And then the last thing we talk about evaluating evidence um, about how not all evidence is good evidence and how it has to be reliable and relevant. So um, after watching John Green talk about that, we have them to do a slide deck about the difference between social media posts that provide credible evidence and those that don't. And so like this one is one of the examples we post and we have them do a thumbs up, thumbs down if they feel like it provided credible evidence and hopefully they'll say thumbs down. <laughs> and basically, and I ask them what, what's missing from this, you know, and they'll say, hopefully they'll say the link that shows where they got this information, you know, cause right now it's just random facts but you don't know where they got it from. And so that's sort of the, the on that's the slide deck pretty much is that we pretty much are asking all of these different um, snapshots of social media and if it provides credible evidence or not. Um, and then we have to do this on their own. So um, the pound cake surviving Easter tornado. So about it's a picture and it definitely looks like it's from a tornado, but we don't know this. And so again, the link is missing from, from what, was seen or where it's getting or linked to a, I guess, a reputable source. Cause then if they, when they do lateral read, they'll find that it's true, but, um, but there is no link to the ABC news article that, that they could have linked it to, you know? And then um, this one, we, we talk about, I think John Green talked about um, spurious correlation, which is like when things are coincidentally linked and rising and falling, but it has nothing to do with each other. It's just by coincidence that the numbers rise and fall at the same time. And so, um, we made this graph. We're super proud of it. But <laughs> so we made this up, but it's by CO2 science. And if they look that up, they would find that that's an organization that is kind of flagged and everything. And it, they, they're, um, they are, what is it called? Uh, they're global warmer. They, they're denying all about that. They don't believe in that and greenhouse, like nothing about that. So um, but in any case, they would hopefully identify this as a spurious correlation and doesn't have anything to do with each other, but um, that's one of the examples that we use. And then lastly, we end with the medical misinformation. It's from the Trust Me documentary, and I think it's available through the public libraries, um, the, oh, what was the name of the, the video platform that they have? Um, but it's, so if, as long as you have your public library card, you can play it, and it's, we just use that one portion. It's really good about um, a family in New Zealand who didn't um, vaccinate her child because she thought it would create autism and how she got that um, the information from the internet at the time and how her child actually had um, tetanus or not tetanus, but um, oh, what is it? The, uh, what is it when they arch their back and they get the uh, um, shucks? It's one of the MMR vaccines. They didn't take the vaccine. And so they got that. So he had to go into a coma because they had to just let it ride out. And it was really, um, yeah, it's a hard video to watch because, you know, the mother is speaking and the, and the boy is fine today, but it was just, it's just hard to watch. But I think for the kids, you know, I, I try to tell them that we've been doing all these exercises with oh, Justin Timberlake, did he make $6 million from McDonald's? And, you know, they're verifying all these things that don't really matter. But like in, in the long run, it does. In life, it does matter if you're getting this kind of misinformation. Um, it's not as light as we've been having them do in these exercises. So this is something that we want them to leave with. And hopefully they, I like, neither know it's serious. Um, and their final group project is an infographic and we have them just choose a topic 
and make an infographic about it. So they could choose any one of those. And as a, usually as a part with a partner, they come up with their infographic. And this was one of the ones that they came up with. I thought it was kind of cute. So they, they made an acronym and they, <laughs> and they drew it, the crab. And they, so they thought that's how they would remember how to lateral read, but, um, but that's, that's kind of what we do here. Um, some of the things that I think were good to know for us and when we're making this course or when we're doing it is that there's a constant need to update the curriculum because things come up, you know, in, in, um, in social media, things come up in the news. Um, for example, I think we're going to have to address chat GPT pretty soon. <laughs> and I don't know how we're going to do that or when, but we're doing, we're, I think we're going to start talking about that really soon. Uh, but just things come up when the Capitol riots happened uh, that year ago, like we had to um, talk about that instantly, like just when it happened. Um, and then also things get outdated. You know, we had a lot of things about COVID. I mean, we still kind of do, but um, a lot of things about Trump, you know, because he gave us a lot of things to talk about. But but again, like it's sort of as time passes, like we don't want it to feel outdated because if the kids think it's outdated, then they'll tune out, right? So we want to make sure that it's sort of updated all the time. Um, another thing is we have to check the links a lot because sometimes the links, for some reason, it just doesn't work or it, <laughs> we, we've used a few things and sometimes it just is not active anymore or it's weird. It, it's something that we constantly struggle with. Um, the search examples, when we do live searches, sometimes, especially the Google Lens, oh my gosh. So when they changed it to Google Lens, it was horrible. Like it was pulling up a lot of foreign foreign results and um, social media results and not nothing from the news sources. And so thankfully they were asking for feedback and I don't know if it made a difference, but we kept on saying, it said, was it helpful? And then we kept on saying, no, no, it's not helpful. Not helpful. <laughs> it's terrible. And so hopefully I think they changed it to, it's a little better now. It's not all foreign and it's not all social media and Reddit and things like that. So, but, but yeah, you do have to check it every time, like right before the class sometimes um, to see if it's still good. And then to collect potential examples as you come across them, because that is the hardest thing to get, like to, to actually come up with videos and the social media posts, it's really hard, um, especially when you want it to be, I guess, um, makes the point, but you don't want it to be um, offensive <laughs> and super, you know, it is a school, it is a class. And so you don't want it to be that harmful, but yet you want it to make its point. So it's hard to find um, things like that, especially videos, um, viral videos is, is hard. So that takes us the longest, I think, out of all of the things. Um, and then the other thing that we noticed too, is that every time we show a video, we have to have a corresponding worksheet with questions because then they won't pay attention if you just show the video. So they tune out, they have a nice, they, they stare at the video, but they're not really watching it. So, so we've learned that. And so we had to um, put in questions where they had to answer questions along the way. Um, but, but that's, those are the things we've learned um, that I can think of, but Sorry, I know it was long. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, that would be great. But thanks for, for sticking with me for so long. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. A couple questions did come in through the chat, but folks, feel free to add more questions. Uh, so one question, uh, they came in anonymously. So the first one was, sorry if I missed this, but can you please share a bit more about how often you've taught this course and then how long each unit takes? Do you have them, you know, for an hour, once a week, or, you know, every day? Um, at Elani, our, our classes are, we meet with the class for about four days out of the five of the week. So for four days, um, it's about 50 minute class sessions. Um, so yeah, so it's about for 15, maybe 15 class periods of 50 minutes. Yeah, that's how long I see them. So we've been um, doing this for three years now. So as long as I've been there, I've only been at Yolani for three years. Um, we've been, I've been teaching this class for three years too. So it gets a little um, a tough because we do repeat the class every half quarter. So eight times throughout the year. Um, wow, wow. Yeah. That's that's quite a lot. I can imagine how often you <laughs> have to revise the content because I've encountered that also when 
especially with misinformation, I think things get taken down. So, which might be good. Um, right. It is good, but it's, it's a bummer for the class, right? <laughs> they, they lock it. <laughs> Okay, another question came in. Uh, your students must have very interesting conversations while working through the units. What are some of the most noteworthy or surprising discussions that you've been a part of? Um, I think it's, well, more amusing. Like I think they, they out their parents and their aunties and uncles a lot. Like they'll say, oh my gosh, my auntie, she, she sends us all these things like this. Or um, someone was from, I think who said his auntie was from China, but in Chinese, she'll send them all these like these fake news stories. And, you know, and he's like, oh my goodness. I like, I said, well, you have to educate her. Like, this is your opportunity. <laughs> and, but, you know, um, things like that. I think also the kids, sometimes they are surprised. I think I feel the most, um, I feel good when I feel like they, it surprises them, you know, like the videos that we show. So sometimes the videos, like the, the fake videos that we show, um, they've seen before. And when they see it before, they think it's real, which is kind of scary. So just because they have, they're familiar with it, they think, oh, it must be real then. But it, it's like when they actually do the letter reading, it's, it shows that it's not real. And they're like, oh, I thought it was real. I saw it before. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't mean it's real. It just means you saw the video before, but but to them, that means that it's real, which, which is kind of, which is a little bit scary. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think that would be more of the surprising ones or the ones that I feel like are, uh, makes us feel like the class is working. Um, but we have no real way of knowing. I mean, honestly, um, we see them for half a quarter and then they leave. And so one of the things we wish we could do is to sort of see if they're using it in their classes. Um, the senior class here at Yelenia is the first, is the only class that hasn't had the class um, because it wasn't it wasn't taught before then. So, I think they took a religion or I, they had something else instead. But yeah, so I but I don't know if there's um, if there's a way for us to know if it's if it's having an impact or not. I yeah, I mean, on that topic, another question came in about whether you give your students any sort of pre or post test for assessment during the unit. No, I mean, we, we could, we should, um, that would be something that we could do. That'd be good. I, we haven't so far. Um, I, I do feel like it, I mean, just, it's more from an observational standpoint, like it's not like an actual pre and post, but I just noticed that the, the responses on the lateral reading tend to get quicker and they tend to, at least the, the answers like, oh, why did you choose this website to validate it? They would say, you know, they would say something like, oh, it sounded good, or it's talking about what I want to read about. And, you know, something, nothing, nothing to do with um, looking elsewhere for information, but, <laughs> but then later towards the end, then they sort of start to get it. And then they start to become quicker with their responses. It gets more on target. Um, so I feel like uh, with the practice, it does it does um, get better. It's just very painful sometimes because it is a lot of the same um, and I see it and I feel it, but, but I, I feel like, well, there's no other way for them to do it. They just have to practice and then, you know, they'll get better, but yeah. <laughs> that's great. I mean, it's, it sounds like you're noticing improvement over time. So that's definitely great to see. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, another a couple more questions. Have you tried tineye.com instead of Google Lens? And if so, did you find it as good? Um, my director did. She tried tineye and she said that we could, but I think it was just, I think for them, we just thought it was something that that Google offered. And because the kids were already using Google, it would be easier to rather than introduce them another site and another way to do things. But, but we did, um, we came across it in a YouTube video. I forgot what we were watching, but they did mention that tonight, um, but we haven't used it, honestly, not in class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point about using tools that students are already familiar with. Yeah. It makes it more likely for them to remember it and use it later. Yeah, that's the hope. But I <laughs> Yeah, that's what we're trying to do, but. Okay, another question. Have you had students who became resistant or upset about the content being discussed, especially political ones? We try not to use things that are that political because we do have um, students who 
who are very conservative and and we are actually two sides of the spectrum so i think we try to stay away from things that are um you know like the, the ones that we use like i think uh, for some of the other ones that we used in the past like the vaccines um we would use not about um we, we, we try not to use things that are i guess things that people would get upset about like I think one of the ones that we use were like vaccines magnetize people. And so, you know, I think a lot of times people wouldn't get upset about that. Even if they were anti-vaccine, they would know that, you know, okay, don't get magnetized (laughs) or, you know, things like that. I think um, uh, in that sense, we try, we were pretty careful with the the examples we used, Um, but that, that was something that we considered when we were when we're looking for examples, because especially with the political ones, you know, we tried to, so I think we talked about like, um, one of the ones was, what is his name, Pence, um, carrying empty boxes and Jimmy Kimmel was, there was a picture about it and I don't know, it went viral. So we use that, um, but just again, tying it back to an actual thing that happened that Jimmy Kimmel talked about and it was fake. So it was, we try to stay away from things that are very sensitive, more, <laughs> more things that, um, I guess we're in the media and in the news and something that they can easily find when they let or read just so they have success when they do it. But, but that's a good point. Cause we did consider that when we were thinking of examples. Thank you. Okay. Another question. So I know you're at the upper school. So question about middle school, do you think that this type of instruction would work well for middle school? How might you adapt it or any suggestions for that? That's a good question. I think um, initially when we started this class, I had questions about whether this could be done in seventh grade because in ninth grade, I felt like, oh, this is like some of them can do it pretty easily. But then I see the spectrum of students that we have and it's um, where some are very new savvy and they know these things. Um, Others are not. And I think for them to be mature enough to accept this I'm not sure that they would be able to do this per se in middle school that being said though I think there's what things we could do like we could definitely scaffold it you know and take things and and bring things the concepts that are easier in seventh grade um in middle school for sure um I think that's definitely something we could do uh I think probably not the journalism unit or something like that, because I feel like they really struggle with that. Um, we teach this course in the summer. So essentially they're eighth graders, you know, just just finished eighth grade going into ninth. And the time that it takes to do the same exercises that they do throughout the year is, is crazy. Like they take so much longer to comprehend things and to get it done on paper and their thoughts and their answers are just crazy. And I feel like it just gets more on target as the year goes on. So I guess they're maturing as the year goes on. That's what I'm guessing in these three years, like we've noticed that the, the time that it takes for them to complete an assignment is so much quicker in the fourth quarter than it was in the first. Um, even though it's a totally different group of students, it's just weird. Like, it just seems that they mature, they, they sort of understand what's being asked of you. They can, their reading comprehension is just better. (laughs) So I think, um, yeah, I think that's a big difference, but I think definitely scaffolding. I think our goal is to sort of have it even in the lower school, we could do lessons in the lower school too. Cause I know she's been open to that too, our, our lower school librarian, but, um, but trying to figure out where that would take place would be rough because I know it's hard to even dedicate like my position to do one class is is a lot. And so I don't know that they would want to um, dedicate another one of us or me again to do seventh grade. I think that would be sort of challenging <laughs> in terms of personnel. <laughs> so for sure. Yeah, I can understand that. So actually yeah. related to that, uh, one question came in, if you only saw the students once or twice, what parts mm-hmm. would you prioritize? Oh, I don't know. I definitely the lateral reading exercise to how to do it. I feel like that's really important. I, mm, I would probably focus on those 
like one of those two of those exercises just because I feel like that's the meat the real meat of the course um the the social media part I think is Im important in the sense like they have to understand the world that they're living in and you know how that matters and and things and I think that's important but in terms of just practical and um things that they can do now and that will help them in their research and even in life just to like to know to look elsewhere and not just rely on what they see on the web I think that is probably the most valuable thing that they get from it yeah um, I can definitely see how that skill would help support any number of decisions in their life and also in research yeah yeah those are good questions yeah, those are great questions. So those are the, all the questions that I saw come in through the chat, but if folks want to unmute and ask questions or put them in the chat, uh, we still have a few more minutes, so. And if anybody um, like could use any of these things and change them or make them better, like just if you could email me, <laughs> because again, we're always looking for ways to, to change things and improve things. Um, constantly so it's um very helpful i think to to sort of see what other people do because um there's so much out there but yeah there's a lot of things we don't cover <laughs> so yeah that would be helpful yeah i'm picturing something like a, a bank of examples that folks can share so since you mentioned that's such a common or it takes a lot of time oh it takes a so long <laughs> so long. Well, I'm seeing lots of thank yous in here. Um, the last question is, what is the best way to learn more? Do you have any advice? To learn more about this, this topic? Or... I think. Oh, um, I, well, I don't know. I, I think just honestly, kind of just looking at like subscribing to the SIFT, um, that again, that provides so much information and and uh, like a weekly dose of things that are happening now. Um, they give like very timely examples of things that are going around in social media. Um, I guess taking classes. Um, I, I took one from Namli this last summer, which is pretty interesting. They, they have a, a pretty good uh, media literacy program and it's pretty inexpensive. I mean, it was like a few hundred dollars, but it was just all pre-recorded and you can watch them at your leisure because the, the time difference wasn't good, but but they recorded everything. And so it was really helpful. You could watch those online too. So I, um, we use that, but the crash course videos, if you haven't seen them are really good too, with John Green. Um, I think adults appreciate his humor more than students do, but he's, he, he tries, he, they try to make it really, um, accessible and entertaining for kids. But again, I laugh at the jokes that the kids don't laugh at, <laughs> but it, it's super, um, but he does speak fast. And so, um, I think sometimes for some of them, it's too fast for them, <laughs> but, but he does a good job. So we, there's a lot of things we don't use that, that we could use, but, but yeah, I think two John Green videos in half a quarter is good. <laughs> After that, they start to tune out a little bit. So my theory is that he speeds it up. I, mm. I, I like, can he really talk that fast? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Um, but I was actually wondering, like, is there a place to look at kind of what you've put together as as a curriculum, you know, an outline for what you're doing and how you've designed it? Is there a way we can look at that and just to as a model for a course? I have like a, a course grid. It's not pretty. It's just a doc and it just has links. I could share them with you if you want. You could just shoot me an email. Yeah. Okay. And and I'll email those. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you.